Praise the Lord. I welcome you tonight. I pray the Lord will enrich every heart with his word and make us stronger in the great ministry he has given to us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the preservation of the lives of your children, your servants, our leaders. We're asking, O oh Lord, that you keep us in good health, strong, vibrant, and spiritual and sharp-sighted in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. And we're asking, Lord, tonight, from this passage, the Lord Jesus Christ himself is sending to us, you enlighten us, and you help us to know the purpose you have called us, and the reason why we're still alive, and the work we need to do for your glory. Give us the strength, and give us the enablement, and make us faithful to the ministry, to you, all through our lives, in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2. And in Revelation chapter 2, we are studying tonight from the letter, from the epistle, from the message of the Lord Jesus Christ to the leader of the church in Pagamos. The passage is in Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 12. And to the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These six, says he, which has the sharp sword with two edges. And then it goes on, it says, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful matter, who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee, because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which sin I hate. Repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will fight against them for the sword of my mouth. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to each of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. That's the message the Lord is sending to us tonight. And he wants us to look at what he has said. As we regard him, so we regard his message. As we respect him, as we love him, as we hold him in high esteem, as we exalt him, so we take note of what he has sent unto us. You know, if uh, somebody is speaking to you, and you respect him, you love him, you exalt him, you appreciate him, and you give him regard, you will listen attentively to what he's saying. And if he has any instruction in what he has said unto you, your love, and your exaltation, your respect for him, your regard for him will make you to want to go and carry out the instruction is given. But if we don't have any regard for somebody talking, we might hear what he says, but we don't pay attention, we're listless, we're a kind of a reserve as to that, and we might say we have our own ideas to, we have our own opinion to, and that shows our attitude to the person talking. And because Jesus Christ is the one that is talking to us, and in fact, he concludes the message by saying, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the church, is telling us what he has said, it's what the Spirit is saying. 
What he said to the church in Pagamos is what the Spirit is saying to all the churches in all the generations, in our own generation, in your own locality, wherever you are. Let him that has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying unto the churches. From the reading of the text today, you'll find Christ is calling us to courageous leadership in the church. So the topic tonight is Christ's call to courageous leadership in the church. Three things we're looking at as we divide the message to three parts. Number one, the confirmation of our concerned conquering Lord. He has conquered already. He has overcome already. And he sits on the throne already. It's by the right hand of the heavenly Father. There is nothing he ought to do which he has not done for the church. To save, to sanctify, to purify, to empower, to enable, to energize, to commission. He's done everything. And he's now the conquering Lord. But he's concerned for the church. Point number one, the confirmation of our concerned conquering Lord. Point number two, the controversy against cowardly compromising leaders. He told the church, he told the leader of this church in Pagamos, and he's telling you, he's telling me that if we are cowardly, if we are faithful, if we are negligent, and if we're not concentrating on what we ought to do because we're cowardly, he has a controversy against us. If we're compromising, he has a controversy against us, and he wants us to turn around, and he says, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly. Then I will fight against those people that are compromising, that are cowardly. I'll fight against them with the sword out of my mouth. The controversy against cowardly compromising leaders. Point number three is called to consistent, commendable loyalty. It's called, it's calling us, it's calling us to overcome. He's calling us to do the work the way he would have done it if he were here. He's calling us to do his work the way the false apostles of the early church, the way they did it, and he wants us to be consistent about that so that we can render commendable loyalty unto him. Let's come to point number one. In point number one, the confirmation of our concerned Conquering Lord. We're looking at Revelation chapter 2, verse 12. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, and unto the angel of the church in Pagamos write, These six says he which has the sharp sword with two edges. He has the sharp sword with two edges. Now you are going to find, look at verse 16. In verse 16, it tells us, repent, or else I will come unto thee quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's what I want you to notice there. The sword of my mouth. Normally, we carry the sword. People carry the sword in their hand. But he's talking about the sword that comes out of his mouth. The sharp sword of our conquering Lord. I come to chapter 1 of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, we're reading from verse 14. Revelation chapter 1, verse 14, is the description of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, of the conquering Lord, of the overcoming Lord, of the enthroned Lord, as John the beloved saw him, he said his head and his ears were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. His eyes like a flame of fire. And then he says in verse 15, it says and his feet like unto fine brass, as a if they were burnt as if they burnt in a furnace and his voice at the sound of many waters and now in verse 16 he tells us and he had in his right hand the seven stars and out of his mouth look at that again out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword this is not the ordinary sword that, so, that soldiers carry. This is not the ordinary sword that, uh, you know, those who are waging war in the earthly way that they carry is the sword out of his mouth, is the watch of his mouth. 
is the word that comes out and it comes out like a sharp sword against the people who are not living the way they ought to live. In fact, it tells us Revelation uh, chapter 19 and it tells us from verse 15, Revelation chapter 19, reading from verse 15, and out of his mouth, look at that again, please understand that, we don't uh, carry swords like, you know, people of the world carry sword. he himself has said, my kingdom is not of this world, if my kingdom were of this world, then my servant will fight like the people of the world fight, and he'll fight with the sword with the hand, but this is out of his mouth, and out of his mouth, with a sharp sword that with each of that sharp sword with that word it might smite the nations the rebellious nations the sinful nations the contradicting uh, uh, nations and the people who are not following after the gospel that he shall fight with the words of his mouth with the sword out of his mouth he shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron yeah, and he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath and of the wrath of God. So then you understand, he's talking about judgment. He's talking about his word consuming uh, the, the sinners and consuming uh, those who are not walking uh, according to his way and according to his calling. It tells us in verse 16, uh, it says in verse 16, uh, and he has on his vesture and on his thigh, a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. When he comes to reign as King, when he comes to reign as Lord, King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he'll put all rebellion down, he'll put all sin down, he'll put all satanic activities down, and he will do it with the word of his mouth. He has the final word, the word of the church. And that word of the church is shown as the sword coming out of his mouth. Look at verse 21. In verse 21 it says, and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh, the flesh of those that were killed with the words of his mouth and the sword. When he comes, and look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 8. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, reading from verse 8, it tells us how the Antichrist will be consumed. It says, and then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the wicked with capital W, that's the Antichrist. That's the one that will oppose all righteousness. That's the one that will blaspheme the name of the Lord. When he's revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth. Uh, you know, he's using the, another word now, the same thing, you know, the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Uh, there's something uh, very interesting uh, as you look at that same sharp two-edged sword. Uh, we're looking at it now from the perspective of a man of God, of a minister of God that has that same sword out of his mouth. Think about that. Uh, look at Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 6, reading from verse 17. But we'll back up to verse uh, 16 uh, to complete everything. In Ephesians chapter 6, looking at verse 16, uh, it tells us in verse 16, uh, it says, And above all, taking the shield of faith. It's talking about the minister here. It's talking about a child of God here. It's talking about a witness to the Lord Jesus Christ that the Lord empowers because the same peace he had, he has given us. The same purity he had, he has given us. The same power he had, he has given us. The same authority he had, he has given us. And because he overcame, he also wants us to overcome. And we need his faith. You remember, I walk, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to 
quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Now verse 17. In verse 17 it says, and take the helmet of salvation. It's talking to believer. It's talking to a spiritual warrior. It's talking to a man of God, a woman of God. It's talking to a leader. It's talking to a minister. Look at this. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We're told in um, Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 12, about that word of God, which is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it says that is what we take as we battle against error, as we battle against evil, as we battle against the sinner that holds people captive. We go with that same word, with that sharp sword, of the word for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the earth as we go with the word of God and preach the word of God it penetrates the hearts of the people pierces the hearts of the people let me show you an example Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 reading from verse 37 Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 verse 37 you see a Peter had been speaking to the people and the word of his mouth sharper than any two-edged sword the word of God has revealed unto them bringing conviction and the word of God that he spoke unto them bringing them to their knees and it says now when they heard this they were preached in their heart that's the sword that's the word that's the spirit sword in the hand from the mouth of a courageous leader he told them he pointed at them and he said you crucified the lord now when they had this they were preached in their heart and said unto peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do when we preach the word of salvation to sinners it should be like the sword is coming out and piercing them and it's bringing conviction to them when we are filled with the holy ghost and the holy ghost takes that word coming out of us and is coming to sinners and is coming to unbelievers and is coming to scorners and is coming to backsliders and is coming to the people of the world they will not just shrug their shoulders and say well i don't i'm not ready now it will pierce them it will prick their heart and they will say what shall we do to be saved and then peter gave them the word you know what he said already in verse 38 he said repent peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission for the forgiveness of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the holy ghost look at verse 40 in verse 40 it says and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this untoward generation were they offended when he said it was a sinful generation untoward generation an evil generation a religious generation but a righteous generation no they were not offended it says in verse 41 in verse 41 then they that gladly received his word were baptized and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls when you preach the word of god does it have that effect when you declare the gospel does it have that effect when you go out on personal evangelism when you go out on uh, mass evangelism crusades does it have that effect when you speak the word to the people who ought to hear the word and tremble or to hear the word and be pricked and the pierce in their heart or to hear the gospel and be convicted does it have that effect if it doesn't if our messages have not been having that captivating effect that conquering effect, that convicting effect, that piercing effect, that pungent effect, we need to go back on our knees, that God will fill us again. 
saturate us again with the power of the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost will take the word and own that word as his word. The Spirit sword. The Spirit's word that becomes sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing their heart and pricking them and convicting them and bringing them on their knees, bringing them to conviction and to conversion and to salvation. Now, the same steadfastness amid corrupting lawlessness. We're coming to Revelation chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 13. Revelation chapter 2, verse 13. Here the Lord Jesus Christ said, I know thy works. Remember once again, uh, he's talking to the minister in the church in Pagamos, and he's talking to you, and he's talking to me, and he says, I know thy works. Well, if we have been faithful, that makes us happy. If we are diligent in preaching the word of God and doing the word of and doing the work of God faithfully and earnestly, that should make us happy. I know thy works and have record of thy works. And if we know the good works we're doing, then it's going to reward us. On the other hand, if we have been idle, if we have been lazy, if we have been unfaithful, if we have been partial in the preaching of the gospel. If we have not been courageous, if we have not been earnest, and if we have not been saying it the way he wants us to say it, if we're looking at the faces of people, and because of that, we're not telling sinners what they ought to hear. We're not telling backsliders what they ought to hear. We're not telling believers what they ought to hear. We're not telling people in our congregation the word of God as we ought to. When he says, I know thy works, he'll be saying, I know your compromise. I know your corruption. I know your unfaithfulness. I know your fearfulness. And if he's saying that, that should make us afraid. But now he says to this church and he's saying to us, I know thy works in the plural. I know thy works and where thou dwellest. There are some people that say that's a difficult field. That's a difficult environment. That's a dangerous place. How can I be there? How can I walk there? You see, this minister in the church in Pagamos, he was dwelling, he was living, he was ministering in the place where thou dwellest where Satan's siege is. The, the throne of Satan was right there and Satan was operating and Satan would not let anything move and yet this minister stood courageously and he says thou holdest fast my name and has not denied my faith even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful matter. There were people in that church that stood firm and the, a particular person, the Lord Jesus mentioned, he knows your name, he knows what you are going through, he knows what you endure, and he says, I know in those days, it wasn't happening at that time, it had happened in the past, wherein Antipas, my faithful matter, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. When that happened in those days, at that time, they didn't pack up the church, the minister did not run away. The minister did not close the door of the church. The minister did not send all the people away the there after us. And you see Antipas now is gone and we don't know the next person. So all of you run for cover and go and hide yourself. And if we make it to heaven, well and good, uh, whatever happens. But look at this, what is happening. This is a city where Satan dwelleth. They didn't do that. They remained and they held fast. And I pray that wherever you you are, that village, wherever you are, that local government, wherever you are, that region, wherever you are, that state, you will hold fast unto the end in Jesus' name. In fact, it is as we hold fast, we have any claim on Christ in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, we're looking at verse 6. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, but Christ as his son over his own house, whose house we are if, whose house we are if, where his temple, where his ministers, and he lays hold on us, he lays claim on us on the ground, on the condition that we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm 
unto the end. It tells us in verse 14. In verse 14, for we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. If we are holding on, holding fast to the faith, holding fast to his name, holding fast, fast to his doctrine, holding fast to everything he has given unto us from the very beginning. He says then, we are partakers of Christ. It tells us in uh, chapter 4 of Hebrews verse 14. Chapter 4 verse 14, seeing then uh, that we have a great high priest, Satan might be on, on seed, and Satan might dwell in that village, and Satan might have his seed, his throne, in that local government, or cultures the him, uh, might be high in that place, but look at this, seeing then we have a great high priest that is greater than that Satan. And he is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Look at this, look at this. Let us hold fast our profession. Don't look the wrong direction, looking at where Satan is dwelling, where Satan is sitting, but look at Christ, the high priest who has gone and passed into heavens, and who is making intercession for you, who is praying for you, and you will abide there in that place where the Lord has called you holding fast your profession in fact he tells us in second Peter chapter 3 second Peter chapter 3 verse 17 he says in second Peter chapter 3 verse 17 ye therefore beloved beloved minister beloved child of God ye therefore beloved seeing ye know these things before Beware, lest ye also be led away, where the hero of the wicked fall from your own steadfastness. He wants us to abide in that steadfastness. He wants us to remain in that steadfastness, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. It tells us in Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 3. Revelation chapter 3, reading from verse 3 is telling us that remember therefore how thou hast received and heard is saying recollect recall remember those good old days when you first knew the Lord those old good good old days when you were bold when you were courageous when you were holding fast when there was persecution but you never budged and you never compromised. It says, recall that, bring that to mind. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and hold fast and repent. If you are shaking now, repent and become steady, become solid, become steadfast. If you're looking at where Satan's seat is, and if you're looking at where the corruption is, if you're looking at what happened to Antipas, and you're saying, am I going to face the same thing that happened to Antipas? It says, come back and bring your mind back and hold firm. If you're looking at the enemy, rather than looking at Emmanuel, God with us. If you're looking at Satan and where Satan's seat is, rather than looking at the conquering Lord, at the conquering Savior, he says, remember and recall how you received and have heard and hold fast and repent. He says, come back to the position where you ought to be. In verse 11, Revelation chapter 3, verse 11, behold, I come quickly, hold fast. The Lord is coming, hold that fast which thou hast. He says, behold, I come quickly. The rapture may happen anytime from now. You don't want the rapture to meet you as a coward, as a person that doesn't have any strength, as a person not prepared for the coming of your Lord. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. No man will take your crown in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come back. Let's come to point number two now. In point number two, we're looking at the controversy against cowardly compromising leaders. Well, leaders, that's why we're here uh, this evening now studying the word of God together. He wants to build us up. He wants us to stand firm. 
he wants us to be courageous and he wants us to stand for him you might be the only one in that locality you might be the only one standing for the truth in that environment all the other pastors of other churches and ministers of other churches they might be kind of a cutting corners and compromising and, and being very careful they know who not to offend and they know not they know what not to say and because of that uh, you might be the one that is standing up while everybody is bowing down but the Lord has controversy against such cowardly compromising leaders look at verse 14 it says but I have a few things against thee because thou hast, thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of Israel, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols, and to commit fornication. In verse 15, it says, So hast thou also them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which sin I hate. Now verse 16 says, Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Three things here. Number one, the cowardice of compromising leaders. The cowardice of compromising leaders. You see that verse 14, it says, look at that again, Revelation chapter 2 verse 14, but I have a few things against thee. What do you have against me, Lord? What does the Lord have against you? You're silly leader, you're silly preacher, you're still overseer, you're silly pastor, and you're still like the captain of the people standing before them. But as the captain is standing before the soldiers, the captain is shivering, the captain is trembling, the captain is, uh, you know, closing his eyes to where the battle is, and he's not really focusing on to do the work. I have a few things against because thou hast there them not only one person there's one Balaam in the Old Testament but now there are people who are duplicating reproducing the life and the compromise of Balaam you have them and there that hold the doctrine of Balaam they have another conviction they come to church, they say their leaders under you, and they say their preachers under you, they say their pastors under you, their women leaders, their men leaders, their youth leaders, their campus leaders, their ch children church leaders, and they say their you know leaders of that section, that section under you, you have them, whatever you're preaching, they hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. And it says, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I think about this. New Testament church, think about this. A church in the early part of the dispensation of grace. To, and there were people in that local church teaching their members and teaching the workers and teaching the servants of God to commit fornication. How could they convince anybody to sacrifice to idols? You know, they were taking the scriptures, they were mutilating the scriptures, they were misinterpreting the scriptures. Oh, they said idol is nothing. And the thing sacrifice to idols is nothing. If you're hungry and you don't have anything to eat, and you see meat that have been consecrated unto Satan, unto idols, whatever, you can eat. After all, it's nothing. It depends on the mind with which you are eating it. That's what they were saying. And then to commit fornication. Can you imagine in the early church when the Spirit of God came upon the church, upon the 120 and on and on, and the apostles were fervent and the apostles were powerful and they were mighty in the Lord. Can you imagine in that same generation, John, one of the 12, was even still alive and Jesus was sending John, one of the very first apostles, he was sending to this church. It's the first century. 
and it's the first generation and there were people at that time teaching them to commit fornication you see how can they teach anybody like that you know what they were saying they were saying it's all of grace it's all of grace it doesn't matter what you do once you believe in the lord it's your faith that matters and they were saying it doesn't look at what you do outside of the flesh it all only looks at jesus in you and upon you you, have, um, you receive jesus christ it's your lord and your savior and they were saying god doesn't see anything you do fornication he doesn't see that adultery he doesn't see that homosexuality he doesn't see that fighting violence he doesn't see that crime fraud he doesn't see that and they told the people can you imagine and those people were convinced and they were committing fornication because some people taught them it doesn't matter what you do they were no more valiant for holiness and for righteousness and look at J J jeremiah chapter 9 and i'm reading from verse 3 they bent their tongues like their bow for lies they were telling lies concerning grace they were telling lies concerning the redemptive work of christ at calvary and they were saying that's what god is looking at now he thinks sacrifice to idols don't worry and commit fornication don't worry they were sending people to hell from the church pew and yet the pastor there was just uh, preaching his normal message his smooth message his comforting message his real assuring message and the people were there and the sharp sword of the word is not coming out of his mouth to pierce them to convict them and to bend them and to make them bow to the word of god they bend their tongues like their bow uh, for lies for they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth they are not valiant for the truth upon the earth for they proceed from evil to evil and they know not not me says the lord that's why the lord said he had controversy against them and number two here is the corruption by covetous leaders we're coming back to that same revelation chapter 2 verse 14 in revelation chapter 2 reading from verse 14 it says but i have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of balaam who taught balak to cast his stumbling block before the children of israel and to eat things sacrifice unto idols and to commit fornication well these people they were not reading their bibles if they were reading their bibles you know there are people that you know even though they have the bible they not read that bible and they just come they listen to uh, you know the preacher and unfortunately there are people in the church in this church and who knows in our church that when the senior pastor was preaching the angel to the of the church in pagamos when he was preaching they'll not pay attention but when their local leader or who are supposed to be under the senior pastor who are supposed to be under him when they are talking to them and because they didn't even hear what their senior pastor had said what the local fellow is now saying and he's saying thank god for his grace thank god for his goodness thank god for his love and thank god when you raise up your hand and you give your life to the lord jesus christ final that's all he doesn't look at anything anymore that's all they were listening to they were not looking at what happened when balaam taught uh, the Balak to cast his stumbling block for the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed to idols and then to commit wardom, to commit fornication, to commit, commit adultery. Well, those uh, Moabites, many of them died. And when, and it was, two, uh, it was uh, 24,000 people that died of the plague because of that. They were not looking at that. All they were looking at is what, uh, you know, their local people were telling them. And they had that corruption because of the covetousness of Balaam. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 14. 2 Peter chapter 2. We're looking at verse 14. 
it says, uh, having eyes full of adultery that cannot cease from sin, beguiling unstable souls. Those are the people they caught beguiling, deceiving, lying to, deceiving unstable souls, and hatch they have exercised with covetous practices, cursed children, and hatch they have exercised with uh, covetous practices, a uh, cursed children. It was because of the corruption in the hatch of Balaam. You see, there are people that do not look at the background of the doctrine they are holding, of the, the background of the person who is trying to convince them and confuse them and bring them into false doctrine because of their covetousness. And then look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, it says, which have forsaken the right way, those who have led other people to commit fornication or to eat things, sacrifice to idols, they have gone, they have forsaken the right way and are gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Bozo, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. That's the, that's the background, that's the root cause of what Balaam did. And the people that were following after that, that's, that's, that's the reason why they're doing that. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says, but he was rebuilt, rebuilt for his iniquity, the dumb eyes speaking with man's voice for bad, the madness of the prophet. And then in verse 17, in verse 17 it says, These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They don't look at the end of their action. They don't look at the end of their false doctrine. And they don't look at the end of Balaam and the people that hold the doctrine of Balaam. Uh, look at uh, the, uh, Revelation chapter 2 now. We're reading from verse 15. In Revelation chapter 2, we're reading from verse 15. The condemnation of contradicting leaders. It says, so as thou them that hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which sin I hate. The problem was there were other people, another faction, another section, another group of the church, of that church. And in fact, you know, it was a little church, a little church. And yet they had some that were under the influence of those who held the doctrine and the deeds of Balaam. And then in that uh, moderate church, you also had another one, another set holding the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. What, who were those? Well, whoever they were, they contradicted the message of Christ. He opposed the message of Christ. They brought down the message of Christ and they will not flow along, go along, accept and believe the message of Christ. And Christ said, I hate the doctrine they are holding. They contradict the cross. They contradict Calvary. They contradict my redemption. They contradict everything I suffered for. And those contradicting leaders, I am against them. The condemnation of contradicting leaders. Uh, let's uh, look at uh, verse 16. It says in verse 16, Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and I will fight against them. I will fight against them. Whatever people do now, if we support sound doctrine, the Lord will reward us. If we lift up sound doctrine, the Lord will reward us. If we support Calvary, if we support the cross, if we support the crucifixion of Christ, if we support the salvation Christ has brought, the Lord will reward us. If on the other hand, we contradict sound doctrine, the doctrine that reveals salvation and freedom from sin and the power of the gospel that works in the Greek and in the, in the Gentile and in the Jew, the power of the gospel that makes us overcomers. If we oppose that, Christ says, if they don't repent, I will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. 
the Lord is telling us not to go along with the people that contradict, that say anything, that teach anything contrary to the doctrines we're learning. In Romans chapter 16, reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 16, we're reading from verse 17. It says, now I beseech you, brethren, are you a brother, are you a sister, are you a child of God? I beseech you, brethren, because of Calvary, I'm pleading with you, because of the suffering of Christ, it says, I'm pleading with you, and because of the consequences on the people that contradict the doctrine of Christ, I beseech you, I plead with you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions, and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them which preach any doctrine which uphold any doctrine which spread any doctrine contrary to the doctrine which you have learned which doctrine are we learned the doctrine of christ the doctrine of salvation through christ sanctification through Christ, the doctrine of holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, the doctrine of power, the power of the Holy Ghost coming upon us and energizing us to stand for the truth and to hold the truth until the end, anyone causing division, anyone causing offenses, contrary to the doctrine which we have learned, he says, avoid them, avoid them. Look at uh, First Timothy chapter chapter 6. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, we're looking at verse 5. 1 Timothy chapter 6, and we're looking at verse 5. He tells us in verse 5, the hyper verse disputings of men of corrupt minds, destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness, from such withdraw thyself. From such, withdraw thyself. Anyone that is upholding anything contrary, perpetrating anything contrary, he says, from such, withdraw thyself. He tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, reading there from verse 5, he says in 2 Timothy chapter 3, Verse 5, have any form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Tell me the rest there. From such, turn away. Turn your eyes away. Turn your mind away. Turn your attention away. Turn your focus away. And turn your ears away from such. You know, after you have heard the pure word of God, after you have heard everything lead line upon line, precept upon precept, I don't know why you will go to the internet and you're looking for this, you're looking for that. And, and you know that, you know, that person is not preaching the whole truth and you know he's going to bring some error. Oh, because uh, they said, you know, people, kings and governors and this and that and unions, they're listening to that man and they're looking for, you know, how to employ that man and the methods of that man to solve this problem, solve that problem. Because of that, after you have taken is something you know, that nourishes your body, nourishes your soul, nourishes your spirit. Then you leave that aside. You're looking for the error. And the last thing you listen to before you sleep is that error. And the last thing you look at in the day, in the week is that error. How are you going to uh, escape the judgment that will come upon the people that contradict the serious words of God? You are not holding fast. It says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away from such turn away i pray the lord will give us the seriousness and the heart and the dedication to follow after the lord and not to allow the lord to have and to maintain controversy with us as cowardly compromising leaders in jesus name it tells us in second john has only one chapter second john and we're looking at verse nine in second john chapter one reading 
reading from verse 9 is still telling us about how we stand for the truth. How we stand without wavering and how we will not go at long with the people that contradict the sound doctrine, the sound word, the saving truth, the sanctifying truth that we have heard. And it says in 2 John chapter 1 verse 9, whosoever, whatever the name, whatever the title, whosoever, whatever the popularity and whatever their method of approach, whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ. What's the doctrine of Christ? Salvation through Christ. What's the doctrine of Christ? Forgiveness and freedom in Christ. What's the doctrine of Christ? Sanctification. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ. What's the doctrine of Christ? For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall and cleave unto his wife and they two shall be one flesh and what God has joined together let no man put asunder. Whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ was the doctrine of Christ the rapture in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you unto myself that's the rapture and after they shall be great tribulation and there will be suffering on the earth as there had never been on this earth and then after that shall this see the son of man coming with the clouds in glory with uh, all the mighty angels with him whosoever the transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ was the doctrine of Christ blessed at the pure in heart for they shall see God was the doctrine of Christ seeking forth the kingdom of God and his righteousness after this all these things shall be added unto you whosoever transgresses and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, as not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. And then he tells us in verse 10, after he has told us that we must abide in the doctrine of Christ, if there come any unto you, if there come any, either they come directly or they come through uh, technology or they come through their programs, whatever, if there come any unto to you and bring not this doctrine the doctrine of Christ receive him not into your house neither bid him God's speed because in verse 11 because whosoever for he that bideth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds will come to point number three now in point number three this is a call is called to consistent commendable loyalty is called to consistent commendable loyalty look at that it wants us to be consistent not believe this today and believe another scene tomorrow today we are up tomorrow we are down and today we're in the sanctuary of the blessing and tomorrow we're in the synagogue of satan not up and down and fast and slow we're consistent as we're loyal unto the lord a kind of loyalty that god himself will come in and he's calling us to that is called to consistent commendable loyalty it tells us Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 16, repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them of the sword of my mouth. In verse 17, it says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. He that has an ear, everything we're hearing on Tuesdays, on Mondays, on Thursdays, on Saturdays, on Sundays, everything we're hearing, hearing from the Central Headquarters Church and hearing from our overseers, hearing from our regional overseers, state overseers, national overseers, 
hearing from my local pastors, hearing in the district churches and the groups, hearing the word of God, the pure word of God, the unadulterated word of God, the saving truth of the word of God that we're hearing. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches unto the churches the same thing is says to all the churches the churches in the north the churches in the south the same thing the churches in the east the churches in the west the same the same thing the churches within the nation the churches outside the nation the same thing he that has an ear let him hear what the spirit says unto the churches to him that overcometh think about that the blessing does not come to everyone that has heard but the people that are obedient to what they have heard the people that overcome because of what they have heard the people who are consistently loyal consistently faithful those are the people that will have the blessing of hearing to him that overcometh will i give to each of the hidden manner and will give him personal and will give him the lord will look at us one by one the lord will pick us up one by one the lord will identify us one by one he has heard he has obeyed he has followed he has repented he has turned around he has become loyal he has become faithful it says to him will i give to each of the of the hidden manna and will give him a white stone and in the stone a new name reaching which no man knoweth saving him saving he that receives it let's look at three things here number one restrain and correct the false prophets restrain and correct the false prophets look at verse 16 there revelation chapter 2 verse 16 it tells us repent or else i will come unto thee quickly and will fight against you and against them with the sword of my mouth repent and contend against the false prophets repent and restrain the false prophets repent and correct the false prophets repent and contend against their falsehood you know where to honestly contend for the faith was delivered unto the saints where to honestly contend for the faithfulness demonstrated by the saints in the early church were to earnestly contend for the fullness of the revelation of Christ as delivered to the saints were to earnestly contend against the falsehood of the people who are preaching error were not to keep quiet I want to be a nice preacher I don't want to be a contentious preacher I don't want to be known as somebody who is always fighting this and fighting that fight the good fight of faith repent and contend against falsehood contend against filthiness somebody is bringing fornication filthiness into the church and they're saying you know this one doesn't matter that one doesn't matter contend against filthiness contend against fraudulence they, they, they are fraudulent in their ways they are deceptive in their ways and they do it with bold face you must have a face that is bolder than the people who are serving satan who are perpetrating error you contend against their fraudulence and you contend against the flesh against the flesh you know the young people they want to allow the flesh the flesh to operate and the flesh to allow this and the loss of the flesh if you are going uh, to be consistent as you are going to be a commendable loyalist to the Lord you will contend against all that look at Galatians chapter 2 
in Galatians chapter 2, we're reading from verses 4 and 5. Galatians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5, and that because of false brethren, they are called brethren, false brethren, unawares brought in, who came in privilege to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, into the bondage of eating things sacrificed to idols, into the bondage of fornication, bondage of the flesh, bondage of filthiness, bondage of unfaithfulness, that they might bring us into bondage. Look at verse 5. Verse 5 says, To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour. Not for an hour. We didn't let down our guard. We kept on watching. And we kept on looking at everything squarely, very well, seriously, scripturally. And if there was anything going to bring any one of the children of God into, into uh, bondage and into falsehood, we fight against that. And we do not give those uh, servants and those uh, perpetrators of the corruption of Balaam and the contradiction of the Nicolaitans, we don't give them chance, no, not for one hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. I pray the gospel and the truth will continue with every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 3. As I besought thee, Timothy, abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some, compel some, teach some, control some, that they teach no other doctrine. Timothy, you cannot say, you know, Paul, you have your own strong mind, strong constitution. I'm not like that. I'm timid. I'm fearful. What are you doing in the ministry? The ministry is for people who are strong, be thou strong in the Lord. And don't give excuse for that's not my nature. We're not talking about your nature. We're talking about the Spirit of God coming upon you and making you to be firm and making you to be courageous that you will charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And he tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, Reading from verse 13, 2 Timothy chapter 1, reading from verse 13, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. Hold it fast. Don't hold it with a loose hand. Don't let, dev, don't let the devil knock it out of your hand. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ. In verse 14, in verse 14, it said that good thing uh, with, as, which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Number two is to renew your commitment to faithful pastoring. Renew your commitment to faithful pastoring. It says in Revelation chapter 2, Revelation chapter 2, reading from verse 16, it says repent, that means return, you have been kind of drifting, return, and you have been kind of weak, without spine, spineless, repent and return, and renew your conviction, and renew your consecration, and renew your commitment to faithful pastoring. This is part of pastoring, that you will make sure that no error is preached or perpetrated in the ministry that is under your watch. Renew your conviction, renew your consecration, and renew your commitment to faithful pastoring. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly, quickly, quickly. You must repent quickly, otherwise repentance may become too late. Repent or else I will come unto thee quickly and will fight against them with the sword 
of my mouth. Verse 17, it says, He that has an ear to hear, he that has an ear, after you said repent, after you said renew your commitment, after you said renew your consecration, then he said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20, verse 28. Acts of the Apostles, chapter 20. We're looking at verse 28. Take it therefore unto yourselves, if you have been careless with yourself, if you have been negligent over your ministry, if you have not been watching over the souls committed into your hands, it says, take it therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, all the flock, all the flock, you're the pastor, all the flock, you see, there are pastors, they don't even look at what the children's section is doing. They can't look at what the campus section is doing. They can't look at what uh, the youth section is doing. And they can't look at what the women's section uh, is doing. Uh, if the pastor calls any of the women and says, I about this, I about this, the women might, you know, act as if, are you a pastor, you're a man, or are you asking me? Your wife will ask me everything and whatever your wife tells us to do, that's what we do. And whatever she directs us to, that's what we do. You are pastor over, it's like over the main. And you can't talk to us and we won't talk to you. And we don't have the desire to talk to you. You shouldn't have the right to talk to us. Where did that come? Is that from the Bible or is that is from a compromising leadership style? Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4. We're reading from verse 15. First Timothy chapter 4, reading from verse 15. It says, meditate upon these things when we're here. Don't throw it off over your shoulder. Don't shrug it off. Don't say, I never thought of that. I don't think that's my style. I don't think I'm going to go that way. Don't say that. Meditate upon these things and give yourself wholly, entirely committed to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Look at verse 16. It says in verse 16, take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. All the doctrine, continue in them. All the things the Lord reveals to us, continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself. Uh -uh. That means if you don't continue in them, you will miss the final salvation. You will not save yourself. Your ministry will make you lose what you got when you first gave your life to Christ. It says, take each unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. It tells us now in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. Look at this. Not only look at this, think about this. Plan to be an overcomer. Work to be an overcomer. Lead to be an overcomer. Preach to be an overcomer. Exercise your gift to be an overcomer. Be in the ministry and be dutiful, be responsible to be an overcomer. It says to him that overcomes, you have to overcome tradition. To him that overcometh, you have to overcome empty religion. 
He to him that overcometh, you have to overcome the flesh. To him that overcometh, you have to overcome the habit that has been going the wrong direction, and the Lord is calling you back. You have to overcome. To him that overcometh, you have to overcome the fear of man. The fear of man that will not allow you to challenge the people that hold the doctrines of Balaam and they will not allow you to, to challenge the doctrine and the deeds of the Nicolaitans. To him that overcometh, the one that overcomes all the wrong attitude, all the wrong approach in ministry. To him that overcometh, to him that overcometh the very seat of Satan, the synagogue of Satan, the servants of Satan, to him that overcometh, the one that overcometh the fear of suffering. Uh, Antipas is gone, this one has happened, and Satan is still planning to do this. The one that overcomes that kind of fear, to him that overcometh, will I give to each of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name which in which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it, reflect on the condition of the final reward, the final price, reflect on that condition that the Lord has given, the condition that he has given, that if you overcome, and if you do the work of God the way it ought to be done, and you turn many unto righteousness, and you make many to abide in righteousness, and you stop the mouth of those Nicolaitans, and you stop the mouth of those the perpetrators of the doctrines of Balaam, and you stop the mouth of the people that are making children of God to go astray if you overcome and you stand firm and you stand straight and you are consistent with commendable loyalty you'll be rewarded on the final day always think about that always reflect on that the condition of the final price it tells us in romans chapter 12 reading from verse 21 romans chapter 12 verse 21 be not overcome of evil. Evil things are all around. Evil doctrine all around. Evil habits all around. Evil um, habits and evil things all around. Be not overcome of evil. Evil Balaam all around. Evil Nicolaitans all around. Evil perpetrators of false doctrine all around. Be not overcome of evil but overcome evil with good and stand like a good soldier of Jesus Christ and then you walk, you do the work of God without compromising and without fearing the people who contradict some doctrine, challenging them and facing them and fighting the good fight of faith. And on the final day, you'll be rewarded in Jesus' name. In Daniel chapter 12, looking at verse 3. Daniel chapter 12, we're looking at verse 3. And they that be wise, and they that be wise, those who hear the word of God and they obey the word of God, those who hear the challenge to become an overcomer and they turn around, they renew their consecration, they renew their commitment and they renew being conversant with the word of God and they renew their courage in the Lord. Those are the wise people and, and they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness they look at those who unfortunately have followed the way of Balaam and they single them and they search them out and they turn them back to righteousness. Those look, they look at those Nicolaitans and they get hold on them and they preach convincingly unto them and they pray and they intercede and they weep and they are passionate about it and they turn them back from the way of the Nicolaitans and they turn them back to righteousness. They turn back the compromisers. They turn back the people who are contradicting the way of the Lord, they turn back
fact the people who are losing their souls who are losing themselves who are just a flowing of the tide in the world and now they turn many to righteousness they will shine as stars forever and ever my brother my sister that's what the lord is calling you to he wants you to examine your ministry he wants you to examine your approach he wants you to examine everything you are doing and he says repent and he says renew your commitment renew your consecration and renew everything that you have got you are consistent now and you're saying lord i want to be loyal i want to be faithful until the final end I will be wise so that as I reflect on the condition of the final price I'll not come in the way of righteousness and live in the way of righteousness I'll minister in the way of righteousness turning many unto righteousness so that you will shine forever and ever when the Lord will come for you soon. Let's rise up now and take everything we've learned to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, brother. Thank you, sister. Let's rise up and take everything we've learned to the Lord in prayer. If the Lord has spoken to you directly, like Jesus spoke through John to the angel of the church in Pagamos directly, Nobody was offended. They just took it to heart because they must have ears to hear. The Lord is calling you. The Lord is calling us to courageous leadership in the church, in our community at such a time as this. And he has confirmed already his concern and his conquering lordship. And he's telling us that we too must have that confirmation. The sword coming out of his mouth, with which he will fight against the people that hold on to error, against the people who are false. And that same sword, the sword of the Spirit, must come out of our mouth, bringing conviction to the people that are careless, the people that are backsliding, the people that are compromising. The word from our mouth should be bringing conviction unto them. And the saints must remain steadfast, like Antipas was steadfast, and he held on unto the name of the Lord, and held on unto the word of the Lord. Why don't you pray, my brother? Why don't you pray, my sister, that the Lord will help you to hold on to the word of the Lord. Remove tradition and remove just religion as usual and come with all your heart all your soul and be firm concretely on the word of the lord because the lord has controversy against the people that are cowardly against the people that are compromising the people who cannot say no to the disciples of bela the Balaam has influenced them and they're going into the era of Balaam because of a compromise, a cowardly, a cowardly heart and they want other people to follow as well because of the fear of man. Tell the Lord, the Lord will give you the grace and the strength and the fortitude, the courage to say no, that you will not follow the people that have gone down the drain because of covetousness those who contradict the word of God, those who contradict the doctrine of Christ, that you will avoid them, that you stand against them. You will earnestly contend for the faith was delivered unto the saints. You will earnestly contend for the faithfulness that we saw, that we have seen in the early church, that you will earnestly contend for the fullness of the revelation of Christ, that you will earnestly contend against the falsehood of the false prophets, that you will earnestly contend against the fornication, the filthiness, and the flesh being perpetrated by the disciples of Balaam, that you will earnestly contend against the fraudulence of the people doing the work of God deceitfully, that you will not contradict the word of God, that you will run away from those who contradict contradicts the word and that now you will by the grace of God continue consistently 
continue in a commendable way with loyalty. You restrain, you correct the false prophets. Nobody under your teaching, under your ministry, will remain adamant. You know what to do. You remove them if they are adamant in error, if they are adamant in wanting to destroy all that you are laboring for, if they are adamant and they want to inject error, inject falsehood, inject worldliness, and inject the world, inject the doctrines of devils into the doctrines of Christ, into the sanctuary, the temple of the Most High. You will not give them a chance, no, not for one hour. Restrain them. Restrict them and renew your commitment and consecration that you'll be firm in the truth of the word of God and reflect always, reflect always on the condition of the final price, the final reward, and the Lord will reward you on that final day. The Lord wants you to have the reward. That's why he sent the message to the angel of the church in Pagamos. That's why he sent the message to all that have ears to hear, all that the Spirit is saying to the churches. He wants you to be wise. He wants you to shine on the final day of the brightness of the firmament. And he wants you to turn many to righteousness, not to turn the righteous to filthiness, to fornication. He wants you to turn sinners to become saints, righteousness so that you will shine as stars forever and ever. I pray you'll have ears to hear and the Lord will give you the passion, the fervency, the commitment, the conviction, the consistency to keep on following after the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the way you have spoken to us directly. We pray, Lord, the spirit of the living God, the Holy Ghost, will take the word and apply it to every heart, apply it to every minister, and make us to examine our lives, make us to examine our consistency, our constancy, our faithfulness. And if we are compromising, make us to examine our compromise and make us to return, make us to repent, make us to renew our consecration and commitment that, Lord, from now on, will do the work the way you want it done so that on the final day we'll receive the reward of well done, the reward of faithful servants who will shine as stars forever and ever. Give us, Lord, the passion, the pungency, the priority of turning people unto righteousness and making them to abide in righteousness and holiness consistently in their lives. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. Watch over your children, watch over your servants, and anyway there's weakness, give us strength in our backbone, strength in our spirit, strength in the ministry. That our work will be unto the Lord, not as unto men. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.